thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to work with Linda. And yes. Uh, can I take a minute, please? Sure. Uh, I'm Shirley Kendall, and I'm doing the octopus bag uh, presentation. You ever try to chase an octopus? <laughs> they moved me to Sheffield. Room. Oh. For those of you that are here waiting for that, I'm, I'm going to head down there now. Thank you, Shirley. Thank yes. You. I want to. We'll play All right, I'll hurry up so we can go. <laughs> and, um, anyway, this has been a great experience, and it's a great way to better understand some changes, to work together as a team on um, physical, biologic, and social interactions. I don't know if anybody's seen this article. It was out a couple weeks ago, and it um, describes some of the ways that we're trying to better understand climate change by uh, enlisting students and getting in there and observing the shore and predicting change by use of the shore zone database. This, we're really excited about the fact that this project was chosen by Region 10 and the Pacific Northwest Research Station as a flagship project. Now, we don't totally know what that means, but it, it's good. And if all of you band together and say, we got to move forward on this flag flagship project, we can all devise a way of how to steer this ship. First of all, I need to thank all the people that are involved in the project. First of all, the students, the councils, the university people, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, people from Region 10, as well as our funders, um, the Western Wildland Threat Assessment Center and the, the CRAG um, Fund. As we all know, we live in a bounty of um, coastlines and they provide a lot of important foods for us. But the coasts are changing naturally, and the, the land is shifting because of isostatic rebound. The glaciers, the glaciers have made an impression on the earth, and since they retreated, the land is emerging. And because of that, shorelines change. As you mentioned, out at Lemon Creek, the, it's changed quite a bit. And then we also have sea level rise. Mm, a mean level is, a mean change is two millimeters rise per year. And we also have flooding and surge, and the, some of the West Coast streams have, and the Pacific Northwest have some of the highest rates of change on the Pacific and Pacific Coast. And um, because of that, <coughs> places like Yakutat, sure, the land's emerging and the shore's retreating, but you still have high tides, and you, and you have the influx of of top, uh, you have the influx of rivers, and you can have a double whammy, and that results in erosion of the coasts and some of the erosion of the World War II materials moving into the sea, which is a concern. All of these factors merge together, and they change the coastal resources, which in turn change resil resilience and vulnerabilities. And so we are taking a multidisciplinary approach to better understand these changes. So our objective was to gain a better understanding of community threats and vulnerabilities by asking the four questions, how is the land changing? How does this change affect shoreline species? And how are the communities impacted? And finally, Finally, we'll get at a better understanding of how communities can adapt. So we chose six communities. Initially, they were chosen because they overlapped with some of the work that Jim Powell and Linda did. And we used the shore zone database within regions, within these communities. The shore, the, um, we took um, regions that were about 19, um, meter or 19 miles from the community centers and areas were cut off if they weren't accessible by boat from the community center. And then we utilized the database of the shoreline, uh, of shoreline, which gives you segments that are, that range in length of yards to uh, miles based 
upon uniform rock type bio bands, which are which would include species like canopy kelps, red algae, eelgrass, and also um, ha they have similar um, exposures or the fetch, you know, the amount of of open water exposure. And once we had the database for those regions, we merged bathymetry in order to get an estimate of the slope off the shore. And then we also merged the GPS data from the University of Alaska Fairbanks because they have measurements of how the land <coughs> is changing. So we made a map, a continuous map of Southeast Alaska to show that change. And then we incorporated sea level rise at a continuous rate of two millimeters per year. And so what we do is put this all together and see what the changes are going to be in 100 years. We assess these changes by exposure, exposure, slope, and substrate, or the, you know, the sand, the, the sand, mud, rock types. And then we evaluate likely changes in the um, species. And then we relate these changes to potential vulnerabilities. And we also used information that has been gathered on food uses, and we incorporated um, uh, the, inter or the discussions with, uh, of the students with community members. So, in a nutshell, we just, we look at the change along the coast. We use simple geometry to assess that change, and thus slope and shape really matter. We, we use the GPS measurements to, watch, to monitor the height of the water on the shoreline. We looked at changes in shore width, and from that we were able to get the changes in the length of the, the little shore segments along the, the, the shore. And this is a student, Sierra Azare, on the shore looking at the um, substrate and she will also be integral in helping pull the data together. But just to give an analogy of what I mean by segment change and why slope and substrate are important, here is, here is Starfish Island. And this is a hypothetical island that is, um, imagine a starfish with web, that has webs in between its arms. Here, you would have a protected bay close to shore. Typically, it would be composed of mud, sand, low slope gradient providing eelgrass and um, butter clam habitats. And on the outside, where it's more exposed, you typically have um, black seaweed and potentially ribbon pelts. Now, if the, if the land is rising and the sea level is going out, the, there would be a reduction in the length of these, hypothetically, of eelgrass and butter clam habitats, and potentially an, um, an increase in um, seaweed and ribbon pelts. Now, the converse could happen, um, and this is what is typically occurring to the south part of um, southeast Alaska. Because in the north, you have the major changes because of isostatic rebound, but in the south, there isn't much influence of the isostatic rebound and more influence of sea level rise. And so in this case, you would have sea, the sea moving into the land and you possibly could have reduction in the um, ribbon kelps and, and black seaweed. And potentially, depending upon the speed that new habitat is created, you could potentially have um, increases in eelgrass. But that's, that's hypothetic. And Obviously, refugia is key. Okay, back to reality. This is what this is what the 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 area within the communities. This is the composition of the substrates, and as you can see, they're pretty diverse, which is really important for resilient communities. And obviously, the people select really really good areas to live because of this diversity. And these substrate types are actually linked to slope, where you have the rocky substrates and their higher slopes, 
and the estuary substrates, the muddy substrates, are much lower slope. And in terms of exposure and link with slopes, here we have, um, if you look on, these are bars, of, bars and to the um, left side, you've got the protected and the more exposed um, areas to the, to the right side of each of these clusters. And you can see that um, Yakutat, Muna, and Cape have the much lower gradients and are more protected, and Angun, Kluak, and Kasan are much more exposed and steeper. So these uh, slopes and uh, substrates and the exposures did um, end up um, with our prediction that overall there would be more change to the north and particularly in the estuary areas. And in terms of the actual species, we predict losses and gains. And to the north, more um, we expect to see losses of eelgrass, butter clam habitats, and potentially some increases in red algae and canopy kelps. And to the south, some losses in red algae and canopy kelps. And but there are some limitations of the shore zone database biobands. For example, the within the red algae group that the shore zone has the are the ribbon kelps, but no, no information is specified for, for example, the black seaweed category. So we wanted to better understand how um, some of these changes might be occurring and some of the species used by the communities by, and we did that by enlisting students and got them involved in community research. So first of all, we went into the communities and we um, uh, selected students based upon um, talking to principals and native groups and we developed a bunch of discussion points and the, the interns uh, had 10 family conversations and they summarized the harvesting and collecting pattern and uh, the habitats associated with the uh, uh, collection and the mode of transportation and also the concerns. At this point, we've got 60 out of 70 inter or, or discussions back and 75% of them are from natives. So this is the list of use. And no surprise, uh, salmon's at the top of the list. Black seaweed's right up there. And um, there, these species are collected from a number of settings or zones. And the collection and harvesting is quite different in some of the different locations. But, and today I'm going to talk about the preliminary results for black seaweed, ribbon kelp, cockles, and butter clams. So first of all, what the, where the collection occurred uh, is, is illustrated here. The, the white bands are the clam cockles and the black bands are the black seaweed. We have it broken down into some of what I described earlier, the low slope sheltered category town, the communities versus the high slope exposed towns. And just as a reminder, these are the areas Yakuta, Huna, Cape being more protected and less exposed with their, um, some of the areas. And then, so just to summarize, and it is a red, it's hard to read, so I'll just read it out. The clams are found in this mud mixture of sediments for all communities, and um, seaweeds were found in the rock mix for all communities, so they're really uniform in comparison to the slopes. Um, in some of the communities, they're low slope, and in other communities, the species are collected in higher slopes. So there is a variation in the types of habitats where the species are collected. In terms of exposure, the um, 
for the, some of the communities, the clams and seaweed are found in similar areas, but in the high slope exposed communities, seaweeds are found just in the higher, the greater exposed areas. So there are some differences in the communities there. And the students found that uh, by community, and the map is not showing up here, but there's a map under these um, concerns that were noted by the students. And basically, um, Yakutat is here, Huna is here, Angoon, Haig, Kluwak, and Kassan. And the dominant concerns are toxic shellfish poisoning, sea otter predation, pollution, and acidification. And these findings are compounded by uh, expectations of a reduction in some of these habitats just due to uh, changes in the geomorphology or isostatic rebounds, cutting off some of the bays, and this um, kind of emphasizes the need to understand impacts and locate the resilient sites. And for more um, student opportunities, we just want to get them out there and collect water and tissue samples to look at these acidification effects to share information on toxic shellfish poisoning and to partner. What we need to do is partner to better understand otter impacts. And we're already beginning to do that with um, Sonia Ibera and Wendell Raymond and with their cadre of high school students to look at some of these impacts by the otters and where they're happening. Now moving on to the black seaweed and ribbon kelp, the dominant concerns are pollution, number and quality, and over harvesting. And we expect to see these concerns compounded to the south where there appears to be a loss of habitats because of sea level rise. Student opportunities are to actually test, take samples and um, get them tested for quality. And we feel that we probably should have more discussions in Angoon because at this point there weren't that many concerns just to make sure that's true. And further to evaluate the link between number quality and habitat loss. So I was only gonna talk about those couple species, but I just can't help but to bring out some <laughs> one other thing. And um, in terms of community use, um, salmon, black seaweed, salmon berries, and blueberries, they were all really important for all the communities. And then in some of the communities, currants, huckleberries, magoon berries, and gum boots had different, um, they were variable, and there were no trends. But in some of them, there were some really cool trends that were associated with the type of land. And so today I'm gonna quickly describe some of the differences in strawberries, beach asparagus, thimbleberries, ribbon kelp, goose tongue, and crab apples. And I won't go on, it's just not too much. But I, I just think this is pretty cool because here you have an obvious increase in the use of goose tongue when you move south. Yakutat being here, Huna, and Huna, Kate, Kloak, and Kisan. And as you move, and this is moving south, as you move south, there's an obvious increase in goose tongue use, and there's an obvious decrease in ribbon seaweed use, and um, beach asparagus goes up as well. And in terms of strawberries, thimbleberries, and crab apples, this, I mean, the use of crab apples just jumps out. There are so much more use of crab apples to the south and a reduction in strawberries. And thimbleberry use goes up. And I was just reading a paper by Tom Thornton last night, and some of these, some of these differences just can be linked to hydrology. Basically, well, substrate and saturation of the soils. So I, this, I just wonder if some of you might have, uh, might be able to note some of these changes that have occurred in a lifetime, changes in the hydrology that are related to some of these species. And 
are some of these changes associated with beach composition, tides, and forests. Then um, I just wanted to compare this, just uh, bring this up that Hup has a recent uh, paper on how are your berries, perspectives of Alaska's environmental managers on trends in wild berry abundance. And in that paper, differences were shown throughout the variety of regions in Alaska, and they lumped Southeast Alaska all together. But clearly, we have so much variation just here. I just thought it was interesting. And then, um, so to summarize, finally, you can't see this probably, but there, <laughs> this <laughs> is, maybe, I think if we turn off, yeah, yeah. Got the lights? Oh, just one, oh, there we go. see, community food resources appear to be changing just due to the land, and um, community uh, diversity and opportunities for uh, resilience could be found a bit just by looking at this interaction. And we found that estuaries in low gradient areas are going to be most prone to change over time. And things get really complicated when you start working in the influences of pollution, toxic shellfish poison, acidification, and um, the other impacts. But with our students, we're teasing out some of these differences and getting them involved in some of their communities. And I just want to say, some of those students were so proud when they brought their packets of <coughs> discussions back from their communities. And some of the parents met with me and said, my kids are going out, going out and collecting with um, some of the elders. And it, it's been pretty terrific to be somewhat involved in facilitating that. And um, this is our flagship project. And this coming year, we hope to gain uh, some more support for the project communicated to let people know that this kind of uh, work is of interest. We need to hire some more students, and we want to potentially expand this project to do um, engage more <coughs> students and get more um, field verification. So we want to share these networks to build community resilience, engage with the students in citizen science, and to continue this cycle of sharing research. This, there's going to be another Capital City Weekly article, and this is um, actually an early quote from Bethany Goodrich, who wrote this study, and this is maybe the best thing about the project right here, that this project not only engages citizens with science, but also serves to immerse elders and students in important conversations about a changing world. Elders with decades of experience in history are sharing their knowledge with the inheritors of this region, the next generation of subsistence users, politicians, land managers, researchers, and mentors. And with that, I thank you. <laughs> and um, one other, just that this is a new age of sharing and new opportunities to work together to deal with the changes that we're facing. And just like sharing a cookbook, mm. this is a new cookbook, by the way. It looks like it has some great recipes, yeah, including kale chips, chitons <coughs> with soy sauce. And um, I just, we, both of us, Linda and I, look forward to learning new ways of sharing this information, engaging students to, uh, to use the resources, in, uh, work with elders, share influence of pollution and toxic selfish poisoning, and um, engage in networks like the Rio Network, and that's it.